I often say when people have asked me over the years what my philosophy is, I tell them I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican. We gather today on the eve of a historic anniversary to celebrate what happened here in this very hall 70 years ago when the United Nations declared to the modern world an ancient truth that the Jewish people have a natural irrevocable right to an independent state in their ancestral and eternal homeland. Mr. Speaker, in these uncertain days, it's important that we cling to the permanent things and the ancient truths. Among them is the principle that fear is useless. What is needed is trust. As we prepare in the next hour to vote on H.R. 2975, the, the Patriot Act of 2001, uh, I rise as a proud member of the House Judiciary Committee to say this legislation is about trust. It is not about fear. The ceremony of induction of the Jesuit is in the Library of Congress in the card is 6643354. It's an unbelievable admission to the world of what goes on in the initiation of a Jesuit into the profess. The Jesuit Ord, my son, you have been taught to act a dissembler among the Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots to be a Huguenot, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among the Protestants generally, be a Protestant. And obtaining their confidence to speak, to seek to speak from their pulpits and to denounce with all vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope. And even to descend so low as to become a Jew among the Jews that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. You have been taught to insidiously plant the seeds of jealousy and hatred between states that were at peace and incite them to deeds of blood involving them in war with each other and to create revolutions and civil wars in communities, provinces and countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, enjoying the blessing of peace. To take sides with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected. Only that the church might be the gainer in the end and the condition fixed in the treaties for peace and that the end justifies the means. Francis Rooney of Florida earlier this week taking the criticism, shall we say, to a new level. We're saying that we don't like what we've seen out of Strozak and Orr and some of the behaviors that they exhibited which were kind of uh, uh, ends justifies the means behavior. Francis Rooney of Florida. We're saying that we don't like what we've seen out of Strozak and or and some of the behaviors that they exhibited, which were kind of uh, uh, ends justifies the means ends justifies the means behavior to try to discredit uh, President uh, Trump's uh, campaign during the campaign, and we got to get to the bottom of that. You have been taught your duties as a spy to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source, to ingrati ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of the Protestants and heretics of every class and character as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures, and in the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor, and priest, but you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner, as directed by your superiors. For none can command here who has not consecrated his labor with the, with the blood of the heretic. For without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. I promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, 
secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the pinyard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever they may, may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I, at any time, may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. We're saying that we don't like what we've seen out of Strozak and Orr and some of the behaviors that they exhibited which were kind of uh, ends justifies the means, ends justifies the means behavior to try to discredit the President uh, Trump's uh, campaign during the campaign. And we got to get to the bottom of that. Mr. Speaker, in these uncertain days, it's important that we cling to the permanent things and the ancient truths. Among them is the principle that fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Uh, I rise as a proud member of the House Judiciary Committee to say this legislation is about trust. It is not about fear. It is about trusting the law enforcement authorities of this country with the powers, some temporary, some permanent, to stop those who would wage war on our citizens before they level the attacks. We do not bring this legislation to this floor in fear. We bring this legislation to the floor in trust. We trust in God. We trust in the governing authorities that our God has placed for such a time as this. I urge all of my colleagues to join me in strongly supporting the Patriot Act of 2001. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men and women for others. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another reading of Code Word Barbalon 666, Danger in the Vatican, on the 18th of February, 2018. And I'm joined here with Yerk Glissman in Belgium. And how are you doing over there, Yerk? Good morning, America. I'm doing <laughs> just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Romerica is where, where I live. Yep, that's right. The first beast grew. Beats the second. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, we're not really. We try not to be a part of the beast system, but no. But we live in that. So. We live in it, so I guess it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Let's let's just go into the book reading, Cold World Babylon. Yes. Uh, this wonderful book. We are still in chapter fourteen, the Jesuit assignment, and I told you last time that we have to go through quite a list of alumni. Yes, And uh, right. I will start with that right, right away. Whenever there's something that you can add to the information, Brett, um, that the author says here about the, these people, when you have any remarks on persons, uh, because sure. they are kind of significant, uh, significance, then uh, please just uh, interrupt me with the word comment, as you usually do. Good. Okay. We'll do. Thank you. Then I will. Then I will continue reading now on the second paragraph on page one hundred and fifty. Said the Jesuit general Jean Baptiste Janssen. I spoke about him in the last broadcast. When you want to know who he was, quote: How much the society means the Jesuit order will accomplish if only we unite our forces and, in a spirit of oneness, gird ourselves resolutely for the work before us. Unquote. About that one less, I made a comment also last time, so not necessary to go into that right now. It is therefore quite fascinating to read the long list of who's who that are alumni of America's first Jesuit university, Georgetown. Look, Americans, see before you the fruits of papal Jesuit education. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better, P.D. Stewart. Yes. And before we even go into this, just having a look at this and the list of names, do you know what that reminds me of? Uh, no, go ahead. I'm asking you, Brett. <laughs> I, I know. I don't know, actually. You don't know. Well, well I'm tell waking you. up and I'm having my coffee. <laughs> 
I'll, I'll confess, I'm I'm not all with it yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Still waking up. No yeah. problem. Yeah. No problem. You know, this I got two cats, me. right? You know what cats do? They really relax you. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I wake up and I have this little black kitty on my lap every morning. And she just sits there and uh-huh. purrs and I pet her and, you know. It's a good way to wake up. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> call me crazy, but I love my cats. <laughs> no, I, I don't call you crazy because you love your cats. <laughs> I'm cat. just kidding. No way. I'm just kidding. I just it's have to joke. check this here. In Pagina. So this reminds me, that's what I wanted to say, mm. of the first chapter of the book Rulers of Evil. Ah, okay. Yes. And... Even before I go into the alumni of Jesuit uh, University of Georgetown. Subliminal most, Rome. Yeah, Subliminal yeah, Rome. I love the name of that. Which is, the most, which is the most prestigious Jesuit university in all of the United States. I just want to go and read to you from a little part of Rulers of Evil and why this reminds me of it. Mm-hmm. It says here on page two of the book, Rulers of Evil, in fact, when the Holy Alliance story hit the stands, there was virtually no arena of federal legislative activity, according to the 1992 World Almanac of U.S. politics, that was not directly controlled by a Roman Catholic senator or representative. The committees and subcommittees of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives governing commerce communications, telecommunications, energy, medicine, health, education and welfare, human services, consumer protection, finance and financial institutions, transportation, labor and unemployment, hazardous materials, taxation, bank regulation, currency and monetary policy, oversight of the Federal Reserve System, commodity prices, rents, services, small business administration, urban affairs, European affairs, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, terrorism, narcotics, international communications, international economic trade, oceans, environmental policy, insurance, housing, community development, federal loan guarantees, economic stabilization measures, including wage and price controls, gold and precious metals transactions, agriculture, animal and forestry industries, rural issues, nutrition, price supports, food for peace, agricultural exports, soil conservation, irrigation, stream channelization, flood control, minority enterprises, environment and pollution, appropriations, defense, foreign operations, vaccines, drug labeling and packaging, drug and alcohol abuse, inspection and certification of fish and processed food, use of vitamins and saccharin, national health insurance proposals, human services, legal services, family relations, the arts and humanities, the handicapped and aging. In other words, virtually every aspect of secular life in the United States of America came under the chairmanship of one of these Roman Catholic laypersons. And here follows a list of the persons. And the most known to us today are, for example, Joseph Biden, John Kerry, and those two stand example for, I think, in total more than 20 names, the Tapasauci names here in this book. And this is why what we are reading right here in Cold World Babylon reminds me so much of the book Rulers of Evil that Tapa Saucy published uh, after 1996, I think in 2001 or something, it was right. uh, completely published. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, because we see here how, how Roman Catholics in the Senate and in the uh, what's it called? Um <sighs> Actually, in my book, it says 1999. You're published in 1999. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's all right. Cool, uh, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He did it. He did it until 1996, writing, and then after that, uh, after that, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. uh, the committees and subcommittees of the United States mm. House of Representatives governing 
so um, mm -hmm. everybody of these were a, was a Roman Catholic, and we are going now with P.D. Stewart, not to see if they are Roman Catholic, but we are going to see even deeper who are all Jesuit trained and who all have had a papal Jesuit education in Georgetown. And I don't need to go deep into Georgetown because when you go to my playlist on Hour of the Truth and other videos, you will find more enough information on Georgetown than I did already. And I'm already planning since more than two years to do a special video only on Georgetown University. <clears throat> but right. neither Brett nor Tom altogether have found the time to do a little bit of research together with me and come to me to the table to do that. So maybe I have to do it on my own. I don't know. Mm. But I'm going to do that one day. But Ooh, Georgetown University, which is, in, which is in Maryland and is founded by John Carroll, who had 26 years of training in Europe over here in uh, St. Omer's, most and for all, uh, which is in the, uh, in the south of Belgium at the time, in Flanders, which is now northern side of France, in Palais, North Palicale, mm. where he had 26 years of Jesuit training, was the first American mm. Catholic bishop of Baltimore, and he founded Georgetown's Boys School that then later became the Jesuit University as you know it today. Now, without any further ado, Look and see before you the fruits of papal Jesuit education. When you look at His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan, Ibn al-Husin, from 1999 through present. Present, consider please, publication of this book, 2006. Ricardo Arias Espinosa, President of Panama, from, 55, from 1955 to 1956. Gloria Mapapagal, Arroyo, President of the Philippines, 2001 until present. Jose Manuel Duaro Barroso, President of the European Commission, 2004 until present. Prime Minister of Portugal, 2002-2004. And you have to understand he was President of the European Commission. The European Commission is the highest non-elected mm. um, body of the European Union that makes actually all the laws and then they are just passed to Parliament and Parliament cannot even um, discuss these laws, they are just there to sign them. Oh. So the European Commission is absolute powerful and when you are the President of the European Commission that means actually you are the absolutely master over all of Europe and the European Commission is not elected by the people. Very important to understand. Mm -hmm. So here we have Barroso, and then afterward, of course, we have had, and he does not come from Georgetown, of course, that is um, Van Rompuy, who was a few years the president of the EU. Ah. He was Jesuit trained here in Belgium, in three Belgian Jesuit schools. Mm -hmm. But Barroso has a uh, education from Georgetown. Then we come to Bill Clinton, 42nd President of the United States of America. Alfredo Cristiani, President of El Salvador from 1989 through 1994. Philippe de Bourbon, Prince of Asturias, Crown Prince of Spain. Samuel Luis Navarro, Foreign Minister and First Vice President of Panama, son of Panamanian statesman Gabriel Luis Galindo. Crown Prince Pavlos of Greece. Greece, son of ex-King Constantine II of Greece, first cousin of Crown Prince Philip. Louis Munoz Marin, Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, between 1949 and 1962, called the father of modern Puerto Rico. Roger Altman, Deputy Treasury Secretary from 1993 through 1994. William W. Belknap. U.S. Secretary of War between 1869 and 1876. You know, at least at that time, mm. Brett, they called wow. a spade a spade. Yeah, they called that's a right. Minister of War a Minister of a Secretary of War and not a Secretary of Defense. Wow, 1869. That's really that's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, funny. Yeah, that just years. A, that, no, More? that's that's just a few years after the ending of the quote-unquote civil war. Right. Yeah, that's right. And then you have 
And then yeah, you have absolutely. a Secretary of War who is Georgetown, Jesuit Georgetown University trained. Yep. Leah Bierman, Special Assistant to President George W. Bush and White House Social Secretary between 2004 and 2005. Mm -hmm. Pat Buchanan, advisor to Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Reagan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. I mean, advisor to Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Ronald Reagan. I mean, when you read Richard Nixon, uh, <laughs> don't the first word that comes up in my mind is liar, Watergate. You know what my dad yeah? would call him? He called him Tricky Dick. Yeah. <laughs> And Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan was probably one of the absolute biggest traitors of the United States ever to become president. Uh, yeah, yeah, and Ford was uh, pretty uh, involved with what Rockefeller or something. I forget, but uh, he's definitely involved with some pretty questionable stuff if you look into him. Yeah, yeah, I think it's even more interesting to look at Ronald Reagan, who was oh, the American president. Who was the American president to give the sign to the Jesuits worldwide that with his inauguration? Oh, in the, yeah, that's one, right. I forgot about that. Facing the obelisk at the no. facing the obelisk, and by that, giving the Jesuits worldwide the sign that the United States of America is completely, or the churches, the protested churches of the United States of America are completely under Jesuit control. Yes, that's right. That's and, right. And now, was I that, was that, that, that uh, Bob Tress? Uh, did I get that name wrong? No, Bob Tress speaks about Bill Clinton and uh, Waco. Oh, that's Waco. Uh, there was another one, though. Was that Bill Hughes with uh, Facing the Obelisk? Who was it that was talking about that? Do you remember? Yeah, Bill Hughes. Bill yeah. Hughes in his series. Bill Hughes in his series behind the door. On your second that. channel, that's right. Yep. Yeah, it's, on yep. my it's one channel. of the first ones you put up, I think. Yeah, where you have and that I, picture of that. That picture is amazing. Of uh, the, uh, it's like a wide-angle shot of the front uh, area of uh, where they're holding the ceremony for his inauguration. Do you remember, Yerk? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. And it looks you 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 were telling me it looks like a keyhole. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. It does. It does. You should check that out. Maybe put a link in the description box for it. I actually wanted to refer to another video oh, from, yes. Inquisition, from Inquisition Update, Tom Press. Oh, Press, yeah, that's who, right. I who cannot say where that is, uh, where that stands anymore. He knows he read it, but that link is nowhere to be found anymore, and um, that is not so unusual because links like, like these happen to disappear. Oh. Where when when Reagan met um, the Antichrist, Pope John Paul II, and kneeled before him and said, "Holy Father, I give you my country." Right. And I have a video on that on Inquisition Update. You can check my playlist of Inquisition Update, and you will find it there. Right. So this is why I, in my personal opinion, who who I'm a German and far away from America, mm -hmm. uh, when I hear the name Richard Nixon, what I think of, and when I hear the name Ronald Reagan, what I think of. Mm -hmm. Let's continue with the list. Then Paula Dobriansky, the Undersecretary for State of Global Affairs, 2001 to 2008. She was also a member of the Council on Foreign uh, and foreign relations that is probably probably a fort and rotary foundation fella mm -hmm. a member of phi beta kappa all masonic orders and of course the council on foreign relations is a complete jesuit invention mm -hmm. and jesuit controlled until this day douglas feith under secretary of defense for policy 2001-2005 Alexander Haig, Secretary of State in the Reagan administration and Supreme Commander of NATO. Michael P. Jackson, so not the singer Michael Jackson, but Michael P. Jackson, mm -hmm. Deputy Secretary, Department of Homeland Security between 2005 and 2007. Tyna W. Jones, uh, Jonas, Under Secretary of Defense, means Comptroller and Chief Financial 
Central Officer, Department of Defense, Defense 2004, until a few years later. He says present, but that's, of course, not anymore. Robert M. Kimmett, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, 2005, until present. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I always um, mm -hmm. leave out the years that, um, that are in Brexit kids in between those are the years of uh, when they have finished their study in georgetown university oh, sure. Got it. mike mccurry press secretary to clinton uh, between 95 and 98 joe podesta chief of staff to president clinton 98 to 2001 melan verveer assistant to president clinton and chief of staff to first lady hillary rotham clinton between 1997 and 2001 Charles Cawley, Chairman and CEO, MBNA Bank of America, which is now Bank of America, uh, Bank of America, now Bank of America, retired. Uh, so why does he say twice here Bank of America? Well, the Bank of America, because he uh, was educated there in 62, probably the name of Bank of America was early another name. Mm -hmm. I know from other uh, research that I did that the Bank of America, America used to be an, uh, the Bank of Italy. Yes, and that that's was run, right, the Bank that of Italy. Was run, that was run by a Jesuit who financed uh, the, f the first companies in Hollywood. In that right, time. but it was in America, it's, but it's named the Bank of, the, bank of Italy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, well, it was funny. the Bank of Italy, and then they, <laughs> later they changed the name into the Bank of America. Right, exactly. That's funny. Philip Marino, President and CEO, Levi Strauss Company. William J. McDonough, Vice Chairman, Merrill Lynch and Company, 2006 until present. Former President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York between 1993 and 2003. And whenever you get into research of the Federal Reserve System, mm. the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the most powerful of all the Federal Reserve Banks that you have in the United States of America. I think you have uh, 10 or, or 15 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, not in every state, but in a lot of states. And uh, the Bank of New York is the most powerful. Mm -hmm. Marcus Wallenberg, President and CEO, Investor of AB, Chairman International Chamber of Commerce. Marilyn Million, the People's Court Judge. Maria Shriver, NBC TV news commentator and wife of Governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. The Terminator. Yeah. I'll be back, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, man. What a horrible... I mean, you know, who would who would ever imagine that he would be uh, so tied in with Catholicism? I mean, you just don't think these things would be... What? Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger is born Austrian. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. The Austrians are <laughs> Hitler Hello. Comes from Austria. The Austrians are almost all Catholic. I yeah, mean, I don't know huh? much back then. Back when I was watching those movies, I had no idea, man. Not a clue. No, I had no idea at that time either. <laughs> I, I do know now. That's why I tell you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Oh, here we go. Stinky one. Paul Pelosi. Mm -hmm. Husband of Nancy Pelosi, mm. Speaker of U.S. House of Representatives. Three of their children are Georgetown graduates. Yuck. <laughs> Those I people can't have stand the Pelosi's. They are the hideous. Oh, yuck! <laughs> Get these people out. What is wrong yeah, with America? Have... Well, this is part of it. <laughs> Those people have power in your country. Oh, they're hideous. So Paul Pelosi is from 1962, a graduate of Jesuit Georgetown University, husband of Nancy Pelosi, who was Speaker of the oh. U.S. House of Representatives, and three of their, their children are Georgetown graduates. Now, want to do your own research? Have a look at that family and see what these children are doing today. <laughs> Prince Bernhard of Orange. Orange Nassau van Vollenhoven, the Netherlands, between 1988 mm. and 1989. Prince Guillaume of Luxembourg. Prince Hashim bin al Hussein of Jordan. Duao Barroso, President of the European Commission. Richard N. Haas, President, Council on Foreign Relations, 2003, until a few years later. 
a Rhodes Scholar and Director of Policy Planning for the U.S. Department of State, where he was a Principal Advisor to Secretary of State Colin Powell. From 1989 through 1993, he was Special Assistant to President George Bush Sr. Ken Burns, filmmaker, which probably explains why he omitted from his marvelous documentary series, The Civil War, the major role played by John Carroll and the Jesuits in the American Civil War aired on PBS. Oh, man. This is scathing. And finally, Richard Mudd, grandson of Samuel Mudd, who was imprisoned for aiding John Wilkes Booth to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. This list could go on for at least another 10 pages. Yeah. Additionally, additionally, we could not uh, we could note that 22 full-time members of the Georgetown University Law Faculty have in the past served as US Supreme Court law clerks. That is some record. All for the greater glory of God. And I just want to add here, because we are speaking about the University of Law Faculty of Georgetown University, that is also where Viet Din comes from, and he was the author of the Patriot Act that the United States so wonderfully could put into action only a few months after 9-11 happened in 2001. I mean... Isn't it strange, Brett, that mm -hmm. people just don't scratch their heads and say, how is it possible that now we have this attack on the United States of America, right. where the Twin Towers are all of a sudden uh, turned into, into dust? dust yeah. and, and three months later, mm. three months later, we have a paper called the Patriot Act, which has absolutely nothing to do with patriotism, mm -hmm. by the way. I mean... Right. Uh, just in case, if you do not know, I have here somewhere on one of my documents, if it's just going to open here, the laptop is now very slow here, I have stand here what Patriot actually stands for. Do, do you have any idea, Brett, what Patriot Act stands for? Yeah, I do. I've read it. It's pathetic. Okay. But, but you don't have right now because you can't no. read it. To, I, I'm going to read it to you. Please, but thanks. most of the Americans and most of the people who are listening to this mm -hmm. probably think that Patriot Act has something to do with patriotic America. Oh, of course. Because that yeah. was launched a few weeks after the attacks of 9-11. Oh, well, we have to get on the Patriot Act. Are we going to show these damn people that who we are? Yeah, right. Yeah. What does Patriot Act stand for? Uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct Terrorism Act of 2001. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry. Yep. Sorry. No problem. Sorry for the coughing. Um, I, I need to drink a little bit uh, in a second, but then you can tell me. Oh, over. absolutely, here, please. So, Patriot Act has nothing, nothing, <clears throat> nothing to do with patriotism. No. It has everything to do with the patriotism of Georgetown University, mm -hmm. which is subscribed to the Pope of Rome. Mm -hmm. There, it has everything to do with uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct Terrorism Act of 2001. Patriot. Has yes. nothing to do with patriotism. No. But that's how they get the people. And nobody ever asks himself, how is it possible that such a yeah. quite worked out paper, but that has a probably a few hundred pages. Oh, it's so sick. Out, it's so sick. Out, Few weeks after these attack, after these attacks, and therefore the question is, how could that have been done? It must have been done beforehand in advance. Yep, that's right. In that's advance. the only way. Mm -hmm. And if it is done in advance, mm -hmm. then they need, then they knew that they needed it. How did they know that they needed it? Because they planned the whole damn thing. Yep, that's right. And I'm not and no, you're not allowed to question it because that's not an official. Yeah. That's not official, see? 
you, you, you know, this, this, they rammed it through us so hard. We didn't even know it, you know, we're just, it's just like a deer in the headlights, you know, mm-hmm. going along to get along. They call it. It's pathetic. Let me just have a look here. But I'm going to say the right name. Yeah, Viet Din. Oh, yeah, that guy. That's him. Viet Din. Uh, uh, V I E T. And then his past name, D I N H. And he was law professor at Georgetown University and is the author of the Patriot Act. Okay? Yeah. It's just that I want to add to what P.D. Stewart already wrote here. But he is absolutely right when he says that this. This list could go on for at least another 10 pages. Yeah. So let's go to the next page and read on in the book Cold World Babylon. I'm, I'm sorry for all this quote unquote distraction, but I think Please, this you're, here and there. You should have a drink of water too and refresh yeah, yourself I, I, I took a little, little bit. Sip. I took a little sip. Oh, okay. good, good. <laughs> I have the open bottle here, so here yes. there, I will take Sorry for that coughing, but I, no, you know, I don't have a fine. switch to switch off my mic, so I, I couldn't help it. It sounds really good, by the way. Your voice is coming through great. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah, that's because I have the wired microphone. Yeah, it makes a big difference, um, actually. Yeah, it makes a big difference. That's true. But on the other hand, that microphone goes a little bit to my beard, and then you have the stretching. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. But I shaved myself a little bit this morning. Oh, cool. <laughs> There you can go. show you a picture later on when we're done yeah, with this Yeah, I shaved the other week. <laughs> I, I took it all off. I had I had like two inches of beard, man. And I got rid of the whole mm-hmm. thing. Okay, now I'm going to continue on page 152. On April 25th, 2001, Father Stephen A. Privet, Society of Jesus, with his, which is always mentioned with the abbreviation SJ, mm-hmm. President of the Jesuit-run University of San Francisco, told an audience, quote, Listen closely. At the Jesuit University of San Francisco, we aim to educate students to change the world. Unquote. A document titled Report to the Faculty, Administration, Trustees, Students of Georgetown University gives us an idea of what is involved in the Jesuit education, quote unquote, to change the world. The document reveals that the core curriculum for all Georgetown students include Catholic social thought, moral theory, means the Jesuit moral theory, uh, theology, of Thomas Aquinas, uh, you know, the doctor of the Roman Catholic Church, yeah. lived between 1225 and 1274 and wrote this monumental work, Summa Theologica, based on Aristoteles, Plato's, and Socrates' Greek philosophy, Introduction to Catholic Theology, the Catholic Tradition, the Jesuits' Spirituality and Histority, historic, History, sorry, mm-hmm. the Catholic Way, and the Church in the Modern World. Mm. Those documents, um, those are the things that is the core curriculum for all Georgetown students. This means they have to study all these Roman Catholic and Jesuitical works. As Jesuit General Kolvenbach, who was in power at the time of the publishing of this book, mm-hmm. Peter Hans Kolvenbach, who comes from the Netherlands or came from the Netherlands, he uh, deceased in 2016. Mm-hmm. Uh, as he told the, Jes- the National Jesuit Gathering at Santa Clara University in October 6, 2000, quote, the real measure of our Jesuit universities lies in who our students become, unquote. Who those students become is decided on by the powerful, powerful Jesuit devotees in high places who grant them high offices on a quid pro quo basis. In the tears word of Jesuit father W. O'Malley, each Jesuit, quote, actor is an apt one who knows that his part acting, according to circumstances, places peoples on the world stage, unquote. This is taken from the Jesuit Culture, Sciences and the Arts, University of Toronto Press, 1999. So, for example, the Jesuit John Carroll, Bishop, who I, what I already explained earlier, founded Georgetown University, the alma mater of 
Bill Clinton and influential American Supreme Court Justices Antonin Scalia and Justice John G. Roberts, who is a Chief Justice. These two judges are also adjunct professors at Georgetown University. Today, some of the most important offices in Washington are held by Jesuits or their students, not least the diplomatic assignment held by the American ambassador to the Vatican, a Jesuit whose job it is to, quote, represent President George W. Bush to the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> That is what American ambassador Rooney told his fellow Jesuits and dignitaries speaking at the John Carroll Society in Washington, D.C., January 5th, 2003. Now I really have to take a little break. <laughs> you know, Top Fresh, an Inquisition update on First Amendment Radio, took yes. almost a year and 99 broadcasts mm -hmm. to read and explain the and dissect the book that Francis Rooney wrote mm -hmm. uh, during his time of ambassador, United States ambassador to the Holy See, the Vatican, between 2005 and 2008. Mm -hmm. We knew that he was a knight of Malta, mm -hmm. and we expected that he was a Jesuit. And here P.D. Stewart tells us that he is a Jesuit. Now, what I find strange is that Probably Tom must have forgotten this because Tom read this book in 2010, yep. Cold World Babylon, on First Amendment Radio. So when you go to the archives, that means that you have to pay a little monthly fee, and then you get access to the archives of First Amendment Radio, and then you can listen to, for example, the archives going straight forth from the 22nd of June 2010, then Tom starts reading this book. He must have forgotten in the meantime between 2010 and 2016 when he read um, uh, when he read this book from Francis Rooney, Global Vatican, mm -hmm. that he actually was a Jesuit because he never mentions that he was a Jesuit. He mentions he was a knight of Malta. He doesn't mention that he was a Jesuit, so it must have slipped his uh, attention at that moment. That P.D. Stewart wrote before that. Oh, it's this, so hard to retain all this information, yeah. Eric. Oh, this is not. This is not. Uh, this is not to 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 uh, blame Tom for something no, or, or no, to point no, fingers no. or so. No, it's no. just. It's just the point. In fact, uh, you, uh, we talked about that yesterday in Bible study a little bit, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't. I guess I can't really say, you know, I blame Tom at all for being a little upset about about it because he's worked so hard at it, you know, trying to expose these people for what they really are, and and mm -hmm. you know, there's so few people that listen. Yeah, that's true. It's sad, actually. I'm sure he's really bummed <clears throat> that not enough, you know, you know, I think he he expects, you know, a little support from his fellow man, you know, and, you know, maybe he just doesn't get enough and he's a little upset, you know, I can't blame him for that. I would be too. Anyway, I'm going to... I'm going to repeat this last paragraph because this is quite important, at least to me. Yeah, today, please. To, today, P.D. Stewart says, some of the most important offices in Washington are held by Jesuits or their students, not least the diplomatic assignment held by the American ambassador to the Vatican, a Jesuit whose job it is to represent President George W. Bush to the Pope. That is what American Ambassador Francis Rooney told his fellow Jesuits and dignitaries speaking at the John Carroll Society in Washington, D.C. on January 5th, 2003. Wow, that is amazing. So what type of Jesuit is he? Is he a temporal or a spiritual coadjutor or what? Well, he's an um, ambassador to the Holy See, so he's probably a temporal, right? Right. I would imagine he would be temporal. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, maybe not coadjutor. He's actually a, a full-blown Jesuit, so what do I know? <laughs> Sheesh. I, we, we, we don't know how long training did he have, that he is no. whether a coadjutor or even a scholastic, or maybe even a professed. We, we cannot tell, you know? No. Uh, we know that he is a knight of Malta, 
and mm. we know that the Knight of Mal the Knights of Malta are of course an organization that is completely controlled by the Jesuits. Yes. So that's right. That's the only thing that we know about it. Everything else would be left to guesswork, and I don't do guesswork, Brett. No, I tell no, people facts right. that I can stand on. And the fact that I can stand on is that I know that he's a Knight of Malta and that P.D. Stewart tells us that he is a Jesuit. And I absolutely have no doubt believing that. And mm -hmm. he was the uh, ambassador of the United States to the Holy See between 2005 and 2008. And then later wrote his quote-unquote memoirs on that. Mm -hmm. And that book is called The Global Vatican. And you can go to First Amendment Radio and you can listen in the archives or you don't even have to go to the archives of First Amendment Radio. Just go to the YouTube channel of First Amendment Radio, and there you go to the playlist, and there you will find a playlist of Global Vatican with Tom Fress explaining and reading to you the complete book of the Global Vatican. Yes. And when you do that, in addition to what we are doing here, reading Rulers of Evil, reading this book, and reading uh, Romanism and the Reformation, mm -hmm. and that all in addition to the authorized version of the 1611 King James Bible, then you get it. A history lesson as never before. And all of a sudden, the world will make sense to you. Yes. That's what it's all about, freeing the slaves from their bondage to Rome. <clears throat> In light of these facts, P.D. Stewart continues, we should have no doubt as to the role of these illustrious pupils raised by the Jesuit fathers of Georgetown and the other Jesuit universities all across America. I know that in the minds of most people, particularly ambitious parents, the term Jesuit is considered synonymous with learning and brilliance. But I say to American present parents, mm -hmm. but I say to American parents, and this is no mere polemics, that whatever the perceived academic benefits or the much touted superiority of a Jesuit education cannot possibly contract higher guilt than by giving the minds of your children and youth over to the direction and education of the Jesuits to be poisoned with their maxims. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Again, I have to applaud P.D. Stewart for what he says here. And I'm going to do a little search in... Oops, what's that? I'm going to do a little search in Rulers of Evil. Yes. Um, just give me a second here, because I want to quote from the book Rulers of Evil, a quote that um, Martin Luther said in this book. Yes. And therefore, I have to... Uh, what is that? Um... <clears throat> Why don't I find that here? Don't you have anything to say in the oh, meantime yeah. while I'm looking for this? Uh, <laughs> I need more coffee. Okay. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, now, now I got <laughs> Just it. Easy. Now I got it. Uh, so, um, Martin Luther, seeing that learning against learning was the future of Christianity, and you know, we spoke about learning against learning in yes. the beginning uh, of this uh, of this chapter already. That's huh? right. Yep, we sure have. He voiced an appeal to the ruling classes in 1520 in which he wrote rather prophetically, and I'm going to tell you right now, when you go to the paper that Martin Luther wrote in 1520 to the mm. German nobility on, uh, on the, Christian, uh, uh, the, the Christian nobility, um, you will not find that quote in that book. I don't know if that took it out or whatever, you will not find that quote in there. But anyway, Martin Luther in 1520 said, now listen closely, Though our children live in the midst of a Christian world, they faint and perish in misery because they lack the gospel in which we should be training and exercising them all the time. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Schools will become wide open gates of hell if they do not diligently engrave the holy scriptures on young hearts. Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. Example, Georgetown University. Example, all Jesuit 
founded, controlled, guided, led universities, colleges, and schools. Every institution that is education, but that's also in the economics, that's also outside, uh, in the outside world, in the economic world, every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. That's what Martin Luther said rather prophetically already in 1520. Mm -hmm. We are now 500 years later, and we see, of course, how schools become wide open gates of hell because we see how our children are incapable of dealing with the pressure of school. We see how our children are, through vaccination and all that other stuff, are impossible, uh, uh, are not in the, in, uh, in the possibility of keeping up with uh, the learning pressure that is put on them. And we see how they are turning in, into uh, quite, uh, quote unquote, quite zombies actually in, that, uh, in these schools. And then we wonder how it comes to pass that there are these, um, uh, you, you know, these attacks in schools, like uh, wasn't there last mm -hmm. week an attack in Florida somewhere there in yes, the school? Yes, yes. And of yes. course, when you, when you check the internet on that, you will see that it is probably just another false flag that it's just a hoax i would but imagine whether whether it's a hoax hoax or it's not a hoax it actually makes sense because children are absolutely not engraved with the scripture every day anymore and that's what lacking in our society you know yes that's right you're you got it that's such a great quote from martin luther and uh you know um I remember hearing that from you a, a while back, and I was searching it the other day, and I was searching and searching and searching. I could not find it anywhere on the internet. Well, of course, it's in Tupper Saucy's book. Of course, yeah. that's why. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, that's a powerful <clears throat> statement, and it's so true. But I, I want to retreat to this sentence that we just read, and I want to read it once again. Because I think this is so powerful, so true. But I say to American parents that this is no mere polemics, that whatever the perceived academic benefits or the much touted superiority of a Jesuit education, you cannot possibly contract higher guilt than by giving the minds of your children and youth over to the direction and education of the Jesuits to be poisoned with their maxims. An absolutely wonderful sentence that P.D. Stewart wrote here mm -hmm. that is already taken from William Gavin's notes in 1835 already. So this was also quite a uh, right quite a... Uh, ha! My English. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> quite... Rather prophetically, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. um, that he said that. Mm -hmm. And what is the most important of the two most important words of, of this sentence? Higher guilt, because you actually put your children in a position that they are made guilty, guilty in the face of Jesus Christ. You want to do them something good. And you're doing the worst thing that you can do. And this is why you have to be warned. The Jesuits on the outside may be a quote-unquote correct organization. But, well, that's um, like we already said with this one quote yeah, from Jesus Christ. It's only Christ. because it appears that way. Yeah, yeah. sorry to Out, interrupt. Outside there are shining... There are shining vessels, but on the inside, they are full of dead men's bones. Yeah, that's it. Yeah? And this is what you, uh, this is the guilt that you put on your children when you, uh, when you put them through Jesuit education. That's why you say, you, see, you cannot possibly contract higher guilt than by giving the minds of your children and youth over to the direction and education of the Jesuits. I assure the reader that there is more fact than rhetoric in that one sentence 
that may be found in a library of books about the Jesuits. Mm. And if that, that sentence were understood with the same import as it is delivered by the author, we had no need of any more instructions on the dangers of education from the Jesuits. Brett, I love this book with every <laughs> sentence. <laughs> that just nails it, doesn't it? He absolutely nails it. I mean, yeah. I don't even have to cut it anymore because no. he says it all. Yep. But still, I love my comments in between also <laughs> right. because that shows yeah, that yeah. I'm not only reading it, but understanding it also. Right. These men base their system on indoctrination and then spying. Be assured, you or your children will one day have to pay the Pied Pipers. John Addington Simmons put the issue thus, quote, From the Jesuit colleges, there never issued a son obedient to his father, devoted to his country, loyal to his prince. Never forget, the Jesuits have one objective in education, to acquire the highest offices of state for the men they have poisoned with their maxims. Mm. And then there's a little picture here of uh, Queen Elizabeth II being welcomed by Dr. Charles Mercer. Mercer is the name, I think. Yeah, Headmaster Giles, of Giles, I think it says. G -I. Giles Mercer, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah. Headmaster of Stonyhurst College, mm -hmm. the prestigious Jesuit public school in Lancashire, England. Mm. Stonyhurst is a Jesuit boarding school in England. Loyola approved of his Jesuits acting as confessors to kings and queens. This they continued to carry off with great finesse. And this brings us to the end of chapter 14, Ooh. called The Jesuit Assignment. And we are going to, next time, start reading in chapter 15, A New World Order. Willing or not, ready or not, you are being part of it, alive or dead. Oh, you and we have the double-headed no phoenix or double-headed eagle, whatever you want to call it. Looks like an eagle, but sometimes it's, an it's eagle. a phoenix. Yeah, the, phoenix, <laughs> the, phoenix, the phoenix normally has his wings up in the air, not down. Oh, to the ground. I see. And then the sword underneath his feet there. Yeah. And, yeah, and the, and the crown, crown above of his head. Yeah. That's right. But that's for the next time. That's chapter 15 on page 154 that we will go into the next reading. For today, I think it was quite an intensive reading that mm. you are hopefully understood that these Jesuit educational institutions in the United States of America and all around the world have only one aim, mm. and that is to produce as many agents as possible. Agents for the Pope, agents for the Antichrist, in the light of destructing the Bible and destructing Protestantism, destructing the true and only word of God in this world. Mm -hmm. That's their only reason for existence. If a Jesuit stops persecuting Protestants, he stops being a Jesuit. And that's what they're all about. A fight against the word, the word of of God. And therefore, we have to put on the whole armor of God. As we can read in Ephesians, I'm really sorry, the last weeks I absolutely love to quote Ephesians chapter 10, between, uh, uh, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Oh, you go and for I want to end with this. I want to end with this, uh, my contribution to the broadcast, and then after that you can uh, do a little uh, finishing uh, mm -hmm. touch on this, Brett. Please, go ahead. Finally, my brethren, the King James Bible reads in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that he may, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <coughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, 
that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, that is the first weapon, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, that is the second one, your feet shut with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the third weapon, above all, taking the shield of faith, the fourth weapon, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, fourth weapon, and the sword of the Spirit, sixth weapon, which, which is the word of God, praying always, which is the, second, uh, the seventh weapon, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. It is a battle that is fought spiritually. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a spiritual war. Mm, and I absolutely. absolutely have to pound on that for the American listener. Yes. You do yourself no good when you buy weapons and ammunition. You do yourself good when you take on the whole armor of God and not any armor of this world. Get a grip. Get back to the Bible. Get back to the real apostolic teaching of the apostles who continued the 70th week of Jesus after he was crucified and went up to heaven after his resurrection. He had the first three and a half years and the 12 apostles continued the last three and a half years to finish the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. Take on this whole armor of God that you can stand in the evil day. Until next time, God bless you. Jogna 66, signing off. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jörg, and a wonderful Bible reading that you did there from Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, at the end of this chapter was dealing with uh, Jesuit education. And uh, as we know in America, there is uh, a lot of that going on. We have a lot of Jesuitism here. And um, yeah, it's something we have to deal with. We can't just uh, shrug this off. Uh, we got to deal with this. Um, it's really hard to deal with. Yes, it's very painful. But um as Yerk said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This is not a flesh and blood matter. This is a principality matter. And we have enchained our own people to this principality. So don't take this lightly. Uh, it is uh, a very profound and intriguing study into the Jesuits that we are doing here. And I'm hoping that uh, we can make some more headway here and we'll get these readings out there as soon as possible. I have about 20 videos to make at the moment. So um, I uh, will, uh, I'll have to get cruising on that too. And uh, I hope to uh, get those out there really soon. And uh, thank you, Yerk, for all the time and energy spent on reading today. That was wonderful. We're going to get back together here in a few minutes and do another session. So that's it for this session, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Mr. President, this is the first head of state, Pope Benedict XVI, that you will ever greet on a tarmac. I was stunned to learn this. Why are you going and greeting him at an airstrip? Usually, the heads of states come here. Uh, because uh, he is a really important figure in, uh, in a lot of ways. One, uh, he speaks for millions. Two, uh, he doesn't come as a politician. He comes as a man of faith. And three, that um, I, I, I so subscribe to his notion that there are, there's right and wrong in life. that. Um, 
that moral relativism uh, has the danger of undermining the capacity to have more hopeful and free societies that I'd, I'd want to honor uh, his convictions as well. You read his book on Europe, I'm told. What do, what do you take generally from his appraisal of Europe and the world, and why is this relationship between the United States and the Holy See so important to you? Well, first of all, it's important to me because the Holy Father represents and stands for uh, you know, some values that I think are important for the health of the country. Why is this relationship between the United States and the Holy See so important to you? Well, first of all, it's important to me because the Holy Father represents and stands for uh, you know, some values that I think are important for the health of the country. And when he comes to America, millions of my fellow citizens will be hanging on his every word. I do know that in order for a president to be effective, he better bring a set of principles from which he will not deviate and articulate them as clearly as he can. And then not worry about, you know, immediate popularity because popularity comes and goes but what doesn't change are solid principles and I'm going to remind his Holy Father how important his voice is and making it easier for politicians like me to be able to kind of stand and, and defend our positions that are I think you know very important positions to take. Mr. President final question. Yes sir. You said famously when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes what do you see? God. Final question. Yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. Your, ex Your Excellency, thank you for being here today. My question is, since the discussion is about heresy, one heretic who comes to mind is Martin Luther, whose 500th anniversary of the Reformation, uh, the Pope will be commemorating um, very soon, very shortly. Uh, on an airplane interview, the Pope recently said that Martin Luther would, did not err on the issue of justification. Uh, what is your response to the Luther heresy and uh, on the issue of justification and the upcoming ecumenical events and how do traditional Catholics respond to uh, the reports that are coming out? We have already had an infallible response to the errors of Martin Luther. The Council of Trent. <laughs> the teaching of the Council of Trent about the errors of Luther and the people are infallible ex cathedra. And the comments of the Pope in the play are not ex cathedra. <laughs>